Practice Listening Test for IELTS, Version 10. Instructions. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. In this section, you will hear an interview. Steve Brown applied to the Summer Festival Centre for a job. He was invited for the interview. As you listen to the interview, answer questions 1 to 3 by circling the correct letter. First, you will have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now listen to the interview and answer questions 1 to 3. Hello, Mr. Brown. Your first name is Steve, isn't it? Yes, Steve Brown. Would you tell me how old you are? I'm 22. And what do you do? Nothing at the moment, but I'm going to start teaching in September. I see. So why have you applied to the Summer Festival Centre for this job? Because I enjoy meeting with people. Can you cook? Yes, I'm quite good at cooking. Have you got a driving licence? Yes, I passed my test four years ago. What is your favourite sport? I like many sports, such as swimming, tennis, football, but my favourite sport is cycling. Are you able to play any musical instruments? Yes, I can play not only the piano, but also the guitar. It sounds fine. Would you like to ask any questions? Yes, I'd like to know how long the festival will last. Four weeks. And can you tell me how much the salary is? Yes, it's £100 per week. Steve was employed by the Summer Festival Centre and earned some money. As he likes cycling very much, he wants to buy a bicycle. Now he is ordering from a mail order catalogue. As you listen, fill in the gaps numbered 4 to 7. First, you will have some time to look at questions 4 to 7. Now listen carefully and answer questions 4 to 7. Three four one eight five six four, City Mail Order Company. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to order a bicycle I've seen in your catalogue with a 22-inch frame. Bicycle? Well, we have three different models. Could you quote the reference number, please? I'll just have a look. Here it is, number AD58402. Right, I'll just key that in. That's the touring model at £185. No, wait a moment. I want the sports model. If you check, sir, you'll see that the sports model one is £249.50. The reference number is AD58412. I see. It's the sport model I want. Will you take the order down? Sure. Could I have your name and address? Or do you have an account number? Well, I might have, but I can't tell you what the number is right now. We can look it up at this end. It doesn't matter. Would you give me your name and address then? Yes, it's Steve Smith of 31 Green Road, Euston Centre, London, NW14ER. Sorry, I didn't catch the address. Could you repeat it? Yes, it's 31 Green Road, Euston Centre. I'll spell it E U S T O N, London, NW14ER. So it's for Mr. Steve Brown, 31 Green Road, Euston Centre, London, NW14ER. And how would you like to pay, sir? By cheque or by credit card? I'll pay by cheque, as usual. When can I expect it? It should reach you within three weeks. Let us know if it doesn't. We'll enclose the bill with the bicycle. That's OK. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you for calling, Mr. Brown. Goodbye. Continue to listen to the third part of this section. About two months later, the City Mail Order Company called Steve Brown about the non-payment of the bill. As you listen, look at the statements and write T if the statement is true, F if the statement is false, 
or N if there is no information given. First, you will have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. City Mail Order Company, may I speak to Mr Brown? Yes, speaking. Good afternoon, Mr Brown. I'm sorry to disturb you. We don't usually phone customers about overdue payments, but we have, in fact, written to you twice. Written to me twice? What's on earth about? It's about the bicycle we sent to you. You did get it all right, didn't you? Oh, yes, I did. I got the bicycle. And I think I've paid for it, too. Sorry, Mr Brown. We haven't received a cheque from you. That's why I'm calling. No, I didn't pay by cheque. I asked my bank to make a transfer. Well, there may have been a slip at our end, but according to our records, nothing's come in. Could I ask you to check with your bank and let me know exactly when the remittance was made? You know, date, which bank, how it was transferred and so on. I'm sure we'll be able to trace it then. OK, I'll do that. Yes, I think I've got your bill somewhere. We could send you a duplicate if you like. Oh yes, would you do that? Then I'll look into it right away. I'm sure you can sort it out. Right. Then we'll get a notification from you. From me or my bank? I'll see to it. Goodbye then. Thanks, Mr Brown. Goodbye. That is the end of section one. Now you will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. The Student Union is having a meeting to discuss how to help the community. As you listen, complete the summary by writing no more than two words on each line. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. May I have your attention, please? We're going to start the meeting now. I'm very pleased to see so many people here. You obviously all know that the purpose of this meeting is to discuss how to help the community. Next month, the National Union of Students are running a National Community Week. They've asked us to cooperate in any way we can. The idea is that all students should give up some of their time to help the community. Surely that's what we do in Rag Week. Does that mean we're going to do this sort of thing twice a year? No, not really. The scheme is nationwide. It has two aims. To show the public that students are responsible members of society and to show students ways in which they can give really practical help to the community. The National Union of Students haven't made any suggestions. They want the students in each area to work out their own schemes. And really, that's the purpose of this meeting to think up some ideas about the sort of help we can give. Let's discuss now. Any suggestions? It is Saturday morning. A group of students are going to help an old man in the community. As you listen, fill in the gaps numbered 15 to 17. Now you will have some time to look at questions 15 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 15 to 17. Where is Milkman Street? Is it far? No, I don't think so. It's somewhere near. Oh, look there. It's just around the corner. What's the number again? Number 8. Mr Tyler, 8 Milkman Street. Careful with those tins of paint. I'll knock. The welfare office said that they'd written to him to tell him we were coming. The curtains are all drawn. It doesn't look as if anyone's at home. He's probably watching TV. He's a long time coming. He'll be pleased to see us, I'm sure. Go away. I don't want any. Hello, Mr Tyler. Is it Mr Tyler, isn't it? We're the student volunteers. 
Engineers? I don't want any engineers. I've got a gas fire. No, Mr. Tyler. We've come to do your decorating. No, thank you. Not today. Perhaps you could open the door, Mr. Tyler. We've come to paint your kitchen. Well, why didn't you say so? We can come again tomorrow if it's inconvenient now. No, no, no. It's all right. Don't stay there at the front. Come round the back. I never use the front door. Only the back. As a student volunteer, Diana is going to help an old lady in the community. As you listen, indicate whether the statements are accurate or not by writing A for an accurate statement, I for an inaccurate statement, or question mark if there is insufficient information. Now look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Who is it? It's the student volunteer. Hello, you're the student volunteer, aren't you? Yes. Good afternoon. The welfare office told me to come here. My name is Diana. Yes, they wrote to me about this. Come in, please. There. Isn't that nice and comfy? That's lovely, dear. And warm, too. It's really cosy in here. I wish I could get about a bit more. Like you young people, I could go out and see my son and my grandchildren. They live in Edinburgh, you know. I don't see them often. My son has got a lot of work. I used to go out to work. That was after my husband died. Never worked when I was married, though. No? No, never. He used to say a woman's place is in the home. Yes, life's like that. I'll just dust these photos. That's him, the one in the middle of the front row. His moustache was lovely. That was taken when he was in the army. He looks very smart. Yes, he was. I can remember it as if it were yesterday. Well, there we are. I want you to read a book to me. You know my eyes are not very good now. Where is the book? It's on my desk. It is Little Dorrit by Dickens. You know the bit I like? It's on page 201. It describes Little Dorrit's love for her father. Ah, uh, yes, here. She never left him. Nice and comfortable? Here, put this shawl around your shoulders. My husband used to read this book to me. She never left him all that night. As if she had done him a wrong which her tenderness could hardly repair. She sat by him in his sleep, at times softly kissing him. That is the end of section two. Now you will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. In this section, you will hear two short talks about animals. Mark is going to talk about the koala. As you listen, complete the notes with the information you need. Now look at questions 21 to 29. Now listen to the first talk and answer questions 21 to 29. Good afternoon. Today we'll have two students, Mark and Philip, to talk about animals. Mark will be the first. Mark, please get straight down to business. Right. As you know, Australia has many unique species of animals due to its long geographical isolation, such as kangaroos, wallabies, koalas, wombats, dingoes, possums, platypuses, spiny antetras, and so on. Today, I'm going to talk about koalas. The koala is a sluggish, tailless, furry, arboreal marisipal. Koalas are different from state to state in colour and build. Probably, 
because of differences in climate and diet. In Queensland, for example, koalas typically have a red dish or tawny colour. In New South Wales, koalas are greyish with ash-like flecking. In Victoria, they tend to be heavily built with a shaggy coat of a brownish colour. Koalas tend to be solitary creatures. They come together to mate in spring and early summer. At mating time, the males are noisy and quarrelsome. Baby koalas are born approximately 35 days after conception. Although furless and weighing only half of a gram, the baby koala climbs into the mother's pouch unaided. Six months later, it leaves the pouch. By now, the baby koala is fully furred and the mother carries it on her back or cuddles it to her chest for another six months. Normally, koalas have single babies and twins are rare. Koalas become mature completely after four years, although the female is sexually mature at about two years. Koalas only eat gum leaves and drink no water. The Aboriginal word koala means no water. But of the 500 eucalyptus species, koalas eat only about 13. The koala's digestive system enables it to survive on a diet of gum leaves which consists largely of fibre which have a very low protein content. An adult koala eats around one kilo of leaves a day. In the wild, it is thought that the koala lives for about 10 years, although koalas in zoos may live for 20 years. The fully grown female koala measures about 60 centimetres. Males are bigger, measuring about 80 centimetres and weighing 13 and a half kilograms. The koala has two thumbs on each forepaw, opposed to three fingers. In climbing, it grips mainly with these and uses its rear paws for a toe hold in a swift jumping action. It seems that koala may not always have looked as they do today. A recent discovered fossil jawbone indicates an animal almost twice the size of today's typical koala. Also, it may have kept to the ground and even knocked over small trees. Thank you, Mark. It's an interesting talk. Koala is my favourite animal. It's lovely and cute. Philip, now it's your turn. Philip is going to give a talk about giraffe. As you listen, fill in the gaps numbered 30 to 34. First, you will have some time to look at questions 30 to 34. Now listen to the talk and answer questions 30 to 34. Mark has talked about a small animal. I'm going to give you a talk about a very big one. It's the giraffe, a tall, long-necked, spotted ruminant. Male giraffes are usually about six metres tall. Half of the giraffe's height comes from its neck, which is longer than its legs. A baby giraffe is two metres tall at birth. It can stand up by itself within a few minutes and can run well in about two days. A giraffe has big brown eyes which are protected by very thick lashes. Since it lives in parts of Africa which are usually dry with a great deal of dust, the lashes are an important source of protection. It can also cover its nostrils in order to protect its nose. It has two short horns on its head. Like the camel, the giraffe can go a long time without drinking water. One source of water is the leaves which the giraffe eats from trees. Since it is so tall, the giraffe can reach the tender leaves at the top of a tree. Giraffes usually live in small herds and often feed with other animals. Giraffes have two methods of self-protection. If something frightens an adult giraffe, it can gallop away at about 50 kilometres per hour or stay to fight with its strong legs. Well, that's all I know about giraffes. That is the end of section 3. Now you will have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4. In this section, you will hear a conversation about paper and its use. As you listen to the conversation, answer questions 35 to 42 by writing no more than three words for each answer. First, you will have some time to look at questions 35 to 42. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 35 to 42. Peter and Kate have met in the coffee bar and they are having coffee together. Hi there, how are you going with your tutorial next week? Oh good, I've decided to talk about paper and its use. Fascinating, I'm sure. Yes, I think it's an interesting topic. Do you know how much paper you use every year? Well, I've never thought about that. I can't answer your question. I suppose you can tell me something about it. OK. It'll be good practice for my tutorial next week. How much paper does one person use every year? In 1900, the world's use of paper was about one kilogram for each person in a year. Now, some countries use as much as 50 kilograms of paper for each person in a year. This shows how far advanced the country is. You're right. Countries like the United States, Britain, Japan, Germany and Sweden certainly use more paper than other countries. I'm very interested in the history of paper. Are you going to talk about it next week? Yes, of course. Where was paper first made? In China. The Chinese first made paper about 2,000 years ago. China still has pieces of paper which were made as long ago as that. But Chinese paper was not made from the wood of trees. It was made from the hair-like parts of certain plants. In Egypt and the West, paper was not very commonly used before the year 1400. The Egyptians wrote on papyrus, a kind of paper made from the pith of the stems of tall aquatic cyberitious plants. Europeans used parchment for many hundreds of years. What was parchment? Parchment was made from the skin of certain young animals. They were very strong. We have learnt some of the most important facts of European history from records that were kept on parchment. Oh, I see. How about paper in Europe? Well, paper was not made in southern Europe until about the year 1100. Scandinavia, which now makes a great deal of the world's paper, but didn't begin to make it until 1500. It was a German named Schraffler who found out that the best paper could be made from trees. After that, Canada, Sweden, Norway, Finland and the United States became the most important in paper making. They are forest countries. Today, Finland makes the best paper in the world and the paper industry of the country is the biggest in the world. New paper making machines are very big and they make paper very fast. The biggest machines can make a piece of paper 300 metres long and 6 metres wide in one minute. Oh my goodness, that's amusing. What are the uses of paper? Paper is used for newspapers, books, writing paper, envelopes, wrapping paper, paper bags. Yes, only half of the paper that is made is used for books and newspapers. Have you got an idea about other uses of paper? No, I'm afraid not. There are many other uses. Paper is very good for keeping you warm. Houses are often insulated with paper. You have perhaps seen homeless people asleep on a large number of newspapers. Yes, I have. So they are insulating themselves against the cold. You are right. In Finland, it is very cold in winter. It is sometimes 40 degrees below zero centigrade. The farmers wear paper boots in the snow. Nothing could be warmer. Oh, that's unbelievable. Now more and more things are made of paper. We have had paper plates, cups and dishes for a long time. But now we hear that chairs, tables and even beds can be made of paper. With paper boots and shoes, you can wear paper hats, paper dresses and paper raincoats. When you have used them once, you throw them away and buy new ones. You know, the latest in paper seems to be paper houses. These are not small houses for children to play in, but real, big houses for people to live in. You can put one up yourself in a few hours and you can use it for about five years. Fascinating. People have made paper boats, 
but they have not yet made paper planes or cars. Just wait, they probably will. Well, I'm sure your tutorial will go really well. That is the end of section four. Now you will have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.